الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد رب الشحي صدري ويسلي أمري وحل العقبة من لساني يفقه قولي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Dear brothers and sisters uh, Welcome back to the third class of the session Today we're trying to resolve all the technical challenges and difficulties. So we have the slides running up on the board. We're going to have the lights turned off in a second. Um, and what I'll do today is I'll do a quick recap of the last few lessons, two lessons, and we'll try to finish the Izutsu theory today so that next week we can begin with Wilaya uh, in the Quran. That will be the topic for next week. What we're going to do is we're going to survey the words uh, of uh, the root word wilaya in the Qur'an and any derivatives of wilaya that come in the Qur'an try to see how the Qur'an used it in the Qur'anic language system and uh, then we will try to uh, move on to the ahadith see the development of the notion throughout Islamic history so we're going to start with pre-Islam the Qur'an, what it came and did with the term then post uh, the prophetic era the, the Imams, did they maintain the Quranic notion? Did they develop the notion? Did they uh, uh, create new meaning for the notion? So we'll try to understand how Wilaya developed with the narrations and then we're going to move on to the different schools that also use the notion of Wilaya such as the schools of uh, mysticism, you know, Sufism, sainthood, uh, Wilaya, it's, it's a central concept in the uh, school. Um, and also uh, jurisprudence. The jurist has wilaya. From this idea came wilayat al-faqih, the authority of the jurisprudence. So this notion plays a central role in Islamic thought and we're, we're going to see this development throughout the next few sessions inshallah. So today we'll finish Izutsu, quick recap, end that, try to understand his theory about language and then next week we'll begin using his theory to understand the notion and this development within the Islamic milieu. So we're going to begin with the slides right now. And uh, maybe a bit dark over here. But I, whoever's on Zoom can follow me on Zoom, and whoever is not will follow over here. So this is a summary of what we're going to go through uh, with, with this presentation. Uh, we have Professor Izutu's approach to language. His linguistic approach, obviously he based his theory on Quranic uh, terminology and the Quranic language system. We're going to see how Izutsu divides words into focus words and keywords and semantic fields. So uh, we're going to see what that means in a little bit. Uh, then we're going to talk about the development of Islamic concepts. Allah and pre-Islamic, Allah is an example and al dahr is another example. We're not going to go through all the Quranic terms. We just want to use a few terms try to understand how Izutsu applies his, his theory to the Qur'an so that we can take the application and theory and try to apply it to wilaya. Now he hasn't applied it to wilaya. And from, according, like, to my knowledge, um, no one has uh, so far. So uh, there are a few studies made on wilaya, like Maria Dakake, the charismatic community. Uh, she wrote a good book. She dealt with wilaya Quranically, historically, and through a hadith. Uh, Professor Amir Moezi, uh, also in his uh, The Spirit of Shia Islam, dealt with Imami Wilaya, um, but he kind of took an approach similar to Corbin's approach, a more metaphysical approach, not necessarily what Izutsu was trying to do. Um, and there are a number of different uh, books and articles written on the notion of Wilaya, but none, from what I understand, treated it from the viewpoint of Izutsu's theory trying to understand how, that, uh, how the development happened of the notion um, and how it was uh, applied to the Islamic worldview. So we're going to have two examples, Allah and al dahr and then we're going to go to etymology. That is going to be next session. We begin with the linguistic definition of wilaya, and then we move on to the Quranic definition of wilaya, see how it was used, how many verses used it, and um, after that, we'll move into the ahadith, insha'Allah. So moving on to the next slide. This is an introduction. Um, this was Izutsu's 
uh, definition of semantics. We, we're going we're gonna to go through this very quick, quickly. Uh, semantics is an analytical study of the key terms. Let me uh, lower this over here. Okay. Uh, is an analytical study of the key terms of a language with a view to arriving eventually at a conceptual grasp of the Wildtanschauung, uh, which is the German for worldview. It's not technically worldview, it's more uh, precise than that because there's no English uh, equivalent for it, they use the German word. So in studies, you're going to see Wildtanschauung used in English texts because. It's, it's a more precise description than worldview. Um, so it, it, uh, the Wildtanschauung, or the worldview of the people who use that language as a tool, not only of speaking and thinking, but more important still of conceptualizing and interpreting the world that surrounds them. Um, so again, we understand from the past weeks that words are defined in relation to one another. There are linguistic systems. Um, two meanings two kinds of meanings that Isusa talks about, basic meaning, relational meaning. These are all mentioned in the text that I suggested uh, the students read. Um, so this would, uh, th that would give a, an explanation of what this is. So basic meaning is when the word is looked at on its own, such as over here, kitab, uh, by itself, just means book. But when it's put in a linguistic system over here, it's connected to ahl, nabi, wahi, tanzid, Allah, and they're all connected together in a semantic field. This is this circle represents a semantic field. This is a word connected to other words. It gains meaning in relation to those words. So this kitab here means something very different than what that kitab over there means. And the Quran is filled with this, basically. The notions of the Quran and the words that are used in the Quran, um, they are to be looked at not only linguistically, but they have to be seen in relation to the other words that are used. Uh, in order to understand their context. So, very quick recap. There are uh, focus words, and this iman over here represents the focus word. Basically, it's one of the main words that the Quran uh, founds its thought upon. And then around the focus words, you have uh, keywords, which are connected to that focus word, and it, it gives the focus word its meaning. Obviously, the keyword also gains meaning with that connection. So, when you have iman, connected to something like tasdiq, belief. So you, uh, or assent basically, not just belief. Iman is belief, assent is a more like a, an affirmative type of belief where you are certain of that belief. You're not, you don't just believe something, you are certain in what you believe in. Um, so Iman is connected to Allah. Again, you say a mu'min in the Islamic context, God is in the picture. Uh, if you say a mu'min in, uh, and specifically Allah, as, as the notion Allah, not just God in general. Um, and uh, over here we have uh, positive keywords and negative keywords connected to the focus word. The positive is in blue, negative is in orange. Um, this is a point of unity. It unifies all the different notions and it puts them together to give one understanding. Um, and these are uh, uh, what we call here principles of differentiation. Basically, uh, they stand independent from each other, but together they form this one meaning or this deeper meaning of this notion that is uh, spoken about. Um, so focus words of one field can be keywords in another field. Uh, kufur was a keyword in the previous uh, semantic field that we spoke about. Uh, here becomes a focus word. So basically, there are words. Now, not every keyword becomes a focus word. Some focus words uh, some keywords remain keywords and never become focus words. Some keywords do become focus words, like kufr. Kufr, there's a lot of talk about kufr in Quran. It has a lot of weight, like iman and kufr, kafirun, mu'minun, and a lot of notions related to kufr and iman. So even though it was a keyword when, uh, uh, in relation to iman, it in itself uh, comprises a uh, semantic field of its own. And this is an example over here of how uh, the semantic fields are connected to each other. And we have sirat, for example, the path, the way. Uh, one keyword connected to it is dalal. You can go astray from the path. And ihtida or hidaya on the other side. So when you talk about the path in Islam, God, and you pray in the Quran, God guide us to the straight path. 
Now, if a non-Muslim hears that who doesn't have a background about Islam, when they hear the path, they don't necessarily envision the path to paradise or to hell. They just think a path, they're thinking, what kind of what path are we talking about? In Islam, when you say, sirat path, even though the word path doesn't mean anything related to heaven or hell, but in that context, the Muslim or the person aware of this, his mind immediately goes to heaven or hell and other notions connected to the path that the Quran also talks about. There's sabil al-rashad, there's a uh, path of, of guidance and correctness. Um, there's ihtida, guidance to the path. There's huda, there's mustaqim, there's a straight path. There's iwaj, a crooked path. So what is a crooked path? What is a, uh, a straight path? And these are all notions, keywords related to the word sirat. It gives, they give sirat the meaning that God wants us to envision and to have in our minds. So here we have dalal, so going astray from the path. If there's a path, you can go astray. If you go astray, you go by committing certain sins, by having certain uh, wrong beliefs in your mind, and many different ways that you can go astray in the Quranic context. Now, dalal is connected to sirat. It's also connected to another keyword, which is kufr. So again, you understand dalal within the context of a sirat, but then you also understand it in the context of kufr as well. So if you're kafir, you're a dal, you're misguided. Um, and then kufr here is connected to other keywords, such as zulm. If you're a kafir, you're an oppressor. You oppress yourself, at least. Um, if you're a kafir, you have a sigbar, you have arrogance. So arrogance is a... And again, kufr here, in this sense, the imam say in the meaning of juhud. Juhud, al-kafir, the jahid, is someone who... Uh, denies God after knowing him. So not kafir in the more absolute sense. That's why um, you might be a kafir not believing God, but not as a result of your arrogance. So you might not be arrogant. You could be denying God's existence because you don't have enough proof. And you sincerely look for proof and you couldn't find it. So these are connected again to kufr in the sense of knowing that God exists, but denying him uh, purposefully. Uh, Asiyan is uh, connected to kufr. And kafir billah, kufr is connected to Allah as well. And fiqh, fisq as well, and so on and so forth. But dalal here is shared between the two. So here we have these two semantic fields uh, uh, converging or uh, overlapping. Now, we spoke briefly about the development of Islamic concepts. And why we're doing this is because we want to see whether wilaya was a concept that existed before Islam, and then Islam refined it, or what is the nature of that word? Because that would affect how we look at the word and how we study it. So, for example, if the word Allah existed before Islam, it would make sense for any researcher to want to see how it was used, how it was used before Islam and how it developed. Any linguist cares about the development of a concept over the course of history. Did it maintain its meaning? And it kind of tells us the challenge that the person who wants to change the concept has to go through. So if it was a concept that was ingrained in people's minds, or the notion itself, and a person wanted to change that notion, that would be much more difficult in, in many instances than uh, trying to develop a new notion, a new concept. So coming up with a new word might be easier. So the reason why we're doing this is because we want to see what the Prophet did with the Arabic language to change the worldview of the, of the Muslims and the Arabs at that time. And then we want to understand where wilaya fits in this diagram. Um, very quickly, we said that Islam is theocentric. God is the central focus in Islam. Allah is the highest focus word. So there are degrees of different focus words. Some are of higher importance than others. Allah, the whole Quran and the Islamic worldview revolves around God, revolves around the notion of Allah. But the, the thing is that Allah was common to Jahili and Islam. It wasn't just an Islamic notion. Um, back then, the Arabs understood Allah as a creator only most of them at least. Um, so when the Prophet referred to Allah and spoke about Allah and the verses came speaking about Allah, they already had the meaning of Allah in their minds. But what the Prophet was trying to do here, he was trying to change the understanding of notion of Allah uh, in their minds. So we went through this last week. We said the talbiyah, they had talbiyah on hajj. Labaik Allahumma labaik, labaik la sharika lak, illa sharikun huwa lak tamnikuhu wa ma malak. Associates with God. That was their understanding. But they understood God. They knew what God is, or they had an understanding of Allah, at least in their minds. 
Islam came and amended that. It removed the association from God, said that Allah, as a focus word, does not have any associate or partner uh, in, in its definition as a notion. Um, so these are the different religions, some of the different religions that existed uh, prior to Islam. You have a Judeo-Christian uh, background. Of some Arabs were Christians, some were Jews. You had pagans who had around 360 idols. Uh, you had Hanifs who were very similar to Muslims. They prohibited wine and they asked to worship God the One. Um, they might have been the uh, remainings of the Abrahamic faith. Um, then you have others. You had Brahmins. They uh, came from India. They were Hindus. Um, there was connection between India and Mecca because people used to come and trade. And uh, they introduced the religion of uh, Brahmanism to the uh, Arabian Peninsula. You had Zoroastrians that came from Persia and uh, Mandism or Sabianism. Uh, the Quran speaks about them, Sabia. They were also in the uh, Persian region. Uh, it might have been a division from the Abrahamic faith as well, uh, branching out of that. So um, these people had a notion of God in their minds, Allah. So when the Prophet said, you know, worship Allah, they already have notions of Allah in their minds. So it wasn't just about making them worship Allah. It's about uh, amending the notion or fixing it to fit with the Islamic worldview. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says, Allah lillah ad din al khalis, din al khalis, wa la dina taqadu min dunihi awliya, ma na abuduhum illa li yukarribuna ila Allahi zulfa. Okay? So here they say uh, that we do not worship them, the idols or the protectors apart from God, save except to bring us nigh in nearness unto Allah. So they're saying when the Prophet came and told them to worship Allah and stop worshiping the idols, their objection was that, well, we're worshiping them to get us closer to Allah. So this is why we're worshiping to them. So this was their understanding of God, that you would have, you have a God, you have a divine being. With this divine being is not absolute in the sense of not having any associates. The hierarchical structure or the relationship structure between God and the associates in their minds was different from what the Prophet was trying to tell the people over here. That's why he says, to unto Allah belongs the pure religion. Basically meaning that what you're worshipping is impure. So you do have a religion. And that religion is in fact uh, uh, involving some type of worship. But what the Prophet is trying to bring forth is not religion itself. What he's trying to bring forth is a pure version of that religion. So Tawheed basically is to basically allow a person to worship God purely, and not only worship God, because everybody in a sense worship God. These are other verses, they're available on the slides, we're not going to go through them. Um, actually, let me, let's go through the second one over here, just this one, just to show that uh, they were aware of the idea of God. Um, God asks, were thou to ask them, he tells the prophet, were you to ask them, who created the heavens and the earth and made the sun and the moon subservient? They would surely say, Allah, how then are they perverted? So they know that God is a creator. And God is using this dialogue with them. If they know this, then why are they praying to idols? Why are they praying to different uh, deities other than Allah? If they know that Allah is the one who created. It just doesn't make any sense for them to ask for or believe in, in different deities or worship them if God is the one who made the heavens and the earth and uh, the sun and the moon and uh, the, the other verses that show that the Arabs were aware of the notion, aware of Allah being the creator. So the first task that the Prophet had, and the most challenging one, was a semantic and a conceptual problem. These people's understanding of Allah had to be changed and amended. So they had an inherited, distorted conception of God that was ingrained in the conceptual consciousness of the Arabs. This was well, uh, they tell the Prophet, are you telling us to go away from what our fathers were worshipping? Which shows that this was a generational thing. Generation upon generation, worshipping this deity, passing it on. And the more it's part of a society, the more uh, you build the civilization around it. And the more rituals you have surrounding it. So, let's say right now, as Muslims, we have... Uh, things that have built up for 1,400 years. 
that have been added to the religion, that have changed and altered the, the pure religion of God. And to come in to fix this is much more difficult than, let's say, 10 years after the Prophet's demise, when the, when the religion was still pure and still uh, uh, in, its, uh, in its beginning. So the Prophet had to deal with this from the time of Abraham, basically, because what Islam claims to do is that it brings back the Abrahamic faith, the pure faith. So Christianity and Judaism existed, but in this claim there was a lot of distortion that happened to those as well. So the Prophet's challenge here is not to go back 700 years or so to the time of Jesus and try to restore that, even though that's a long time as well. So you have many rituals, many things that the people build around the notions they've developed. But in fact, he has to go back all the way to the time of Abraham, so before Moses and David, alayhi wa sallam. So the people's objection when the Prophet was talking to them, they were objecting to the Prophet saying, have you come on to us so that we may worship Allah alone and leave aside what our fathers worshipped? This was their objection. Why worship him alone? And then they asked him to uh, show him what, what he promised uh, of a punishment so that they can believe. So this is the hierarchy of relationship of God and the uh, idols that the Arabs had. Um, some of the Arabs, obviously, because every uh, idol belonged to a certain tribe. It wasn't, not all of them worshipped the same idols. Every tribe had a specific number of idols belonging to them. Um, so God here says, and most of them believe not in God, save that they ascribe partners unto him. وَمَا يُؤْمِنُوا أَكْثَرُهُمْ, أكثرهم, أكثرهم بِاللَّهِ إِلَّا وَهُمْ مُشْرِكُونَ so they have iman in God. They are mu'minin in God. But at the same time, they are mushrikun. Because they give, they have associates. So you have man over here, and you have Allah, but you have to go through these associates to reach Allah. Or they might even be on the same level. Um, so Izutsu says, in the realm of the supernatural beings, the acknowledgement of the position of Allah as the sole Lord of the whole universe deprived all other so-called gods of all reality. They were now mere names, not corresponding to any real entities existing outside of language. So when you say Hubal as Ilah, what the Quran was trying to do here was trying to show that these don't have a reality. They're not connected to any external reality. When I say that this is, this is a wall, I'm not only creating and inventing an idea in my mind, I'm actually referring to reality. This is a wall here. You can touch it, you can see it. So when I tell you to stand against the wall, you're standing against something real. But let's say I imagine something. I make up a notion in my mind, in my imagination. And I say, well, there's an imaginary uh, uh, line over here. Step over it. There is no reality to that line, except in the minds of, of the people. And therefore, it has no real effect. It has no uh, significant effect on the, on the individuals. So basically, what these w idols were, they were these gods that were invented in the minds of the people. You would pray to them, but really you're not praying to anything. These are just names. But in the minds of those who worship them, these had realities. When they prayed to Hubal, or when they sacrificed something for him, and they ask them for something, they truly believe that they're being heard and their prayers are being answered. But in, really, in reality, what they were doing is that it was only their imagination. So this shows that human beings are able to imagine things. They have this imaginal uh, faculty, which uh, philosophers, uh, Islamic philosophy talks about. And at the same time, uh, we can divide the imagination into imagination that's connected to reality and imagination that's connected, not connected to reality. And there's a very uh, negative effect if we follow the imagination that's not connected to reality. And if we want to take this even further, if we look at the virtual world that we live in, virtual reality, that has a direct connection to this notion over here. We live in a world that's based on uh, imaginary worlds, virtual worlds. Not, they're not real. But we treat those virtual worlds as if they are real. And we base our lives and our convictions and beliefs on whatever is shown, like virtual reality, for example, if you, if you wear that, you know, a goggle or glasses and you play that game, you actually think you are in that virtual world, even though you are not. 
Um, so even though you're uh, uh, you're not. Uh, anyways, that's a topic for a different for a different day. So. We have here uh, the correspondence theory of truth. Basically, if you have a claim, you have to see if it corresponds with reality or not. Uh, and in philosophy, it's called the correspondence theory of truth. Thomas Aquinas says truth is the equation of thing and intellect, which he restates as a judgment is said to be true when it conforms to the external reality. And it's very important for a person to understand that his belief conforms to reality because then that reality has an effect on it. Now imagining something has an effect on you as well. If I imagine that there's a monster outside of the building, I would develop fear, even though there might not be. But that feeling is not a real feeling. It shouldn't exist in me. The only feeling that should exist is something that corresponds to reality because that's what allows me to advance or to uh, regress in my life. Now, we won't go too much into that. Um, the Quranic conceptual systems of the world are uh, dichotom dichotomic. Basically, uh, you have positive and negative, usually uh, contrasting with one another. So you have Allah, you have Satan. You have truth, you have falsehood. You have light, you have darkness. You have belief, you have disbelief. You have guidance, you have misguidance. So this dichotomy that exists in the Quran, uh, and at least this is how it presents itself. It always presents one true notion and as opposed to a false notion. Um, for example here, you have al-zan here, meaning belief. Uh, it's connected to uh, haq and to batil. So you have true belief, you have false belief. And this haq belief, if you have it, you have iman, you have nur, you have hidayah. Uh, the batil, if you have false belief, you have kufur, you have dalal, you have lalam. So that's a negative state that you live in. This is the positive state that you live in. This is reality, that's falseness and imagination. So basically, we can say that one objective that Islam came to do is was to conform man to reality, or conform him with reality, to, to reality, um, and remove him from false imaginations and delusions in his life. وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا أَعْمَالُهُمْ كَسَرَابٍ بَقِيعَةٍ يَحْسَبُهُ الظَّمَانُ مَاءً حَتَّى إِلَى جَاءَهُ لَمْ يَجِدْهُ شَيْئًا وَوَجَدَ اللَّهُ عِنْدَهُ فَوَفَّاهُ حِسَابَهُ وَاللَّهُ سَرِيعُ حِسَابٍ Again, telling the people trying to instill in their minds that what you believe in is an imagination. It's nothing real. As for those who disbelieve, their deeds are like a mirage upon a desert plain which a thirsty man supposes is water, till when he comes upon it, he does not find it to be anything, but finds God there. So again, instilling in their minds that this is an imagination, this is false, repeating it, repeating it to them, and telling them that, you know, just a person when he looks at the mirage, he really thinks it's water. So you really think that these gods do something, but it's not, they don't. There's only one absolute being that affects and has effect in this world. Um, in Jahiliyyah, uh, we're running out of time. I think we've passed the time mark, um, but very quickly, I think there's a few more slides left. Um, they believe Allah as being the creator only from birth, and then they have their lifetime, and then they die over here. That's the end of life, basically. And then what controls what happens during the life is what they call the dahr. And the Quran speaks about dahr in multiple times. So life is terminated here. Dahr is the cause of human misery. Because once you're born, you become attached to things around you. You become attached to your family, your loved ones, your friends, your house, and so on and so forth. What does death do? Death separates you from that. And it ends over there. And what that means is that throughout your, throughout your life, you're just living a life of misery. You have troubles, you have hardships, you have difficulties, because that's what comes with life. So the Arabs, whenever they wrote poetry, and whenever they viewed the world, they had a very pessimistic, negative understanding of the world. Very negative people. Always blaming Dahar for ruining their lives and destroying their lives. Sort of, you know, sort of what we have right now in a sense, to a certain degree. A lot of people, you know, say, what's the point? Or, you know, why is life so harsh on me? And a lot of difficulties people are going through it's because of their understanding of the world. And again, it really plays a big role in uh, your, your understanding. And we'll get to that later. We'll see how much ideation, the philosophers spoke about ideation, how it influences a person's feeling 
and, uh, and his uh, behavior in the world. So Islam came and the Prophet ﷺ came and said that, um, you know what, let's change this model. This is not really what happened. We are born and Allah is the one that creates us. That's first of all. Secondly, death is a station. It's not the end of life. After death, you continue to live. And then you have after life, you have al-sa'a over here, the judgment day, then you have the hereafter over here, which is an internal life. So, in this world, it's called dunya. This is a temporary abode. Hereafter, eternal abode. And Allah presides over all of this. So Allah is not just a creator. Allah is involved in every little thing, every minute detail of your life is involved in it. He's watching you, he's listening to you, and he's providing you with sustenance, and you can always resort to him. So you're part of this absolute reality that's an infinite reality, basically. If you believe this, it would change your attitude in life. Believing that there's an afterlife, you think, okay, if I don't do good in this world, at least in the afterlife I can have a good life. I can go to heaven, and heaven has everything I need. And so on and so forth. Just having that idea in your mind a lot, changes your behavior, changes your mood, changes your aspirations in life as well. So this came, and uh, Allah Ta'ala is also a just God. So His system is a just system. That way, anything bad happens in your life, and you see in the Muslim consciousness, whenever something bad happens, they say, oh, well, Allah will take care of this. Allah will deal with this. May Allah deal with it. No, even pray to God. Deal with this with your justice. <clears throat> so it allows them to treat their problems and deal with their problems in a, in a different attitude. Um, so uh, these are different relationships that God, uh, the people had with God uh, during their time. They were the Christians, who various sects of Christians who believed that uh, Mary was mother, mother of God, for example, and uh, those who rejected that, and the Jews, some of them in the Arabian Peninsula, believe that Israel is the son of Allah, as, according to the verse. So a lot of these sects have disappeared, uh, and they don't exist anymore, so they don't represent sects that exist in the Christian world or the Jewish world right now. They were peculiar to the Arabian uh, Peninsula. Um, so Ibn Arabi, for example, it says that every human being is in an essential state of worship, whether it was God or any other deity, whether conscious of this worship or not. So even an atheist is in a state of worship. What Islam came to do is not to establish worship, but it came to correct, rectify, and purify it. So basically, direct the person towards the highest and purest form of absolute realization, or God consciousness, basically. So a new belief system regarding existence was introduced, the one and only God was established as a su supreme deity and as sole source of all human actions and all forms of being in existence. Existent concepts were rearranged and, uh, and allotted new meanings. New concepts were introduced and relationships were established between both. One of those relationships is um, wilaya. This is the end of the slides. And uh, one of the relationships that uh, the Quran introduces. Um, is, there's a, is there a light switch behind you, if you don't mind? No? Turn the lights on, thank you. So, thank you. so one of the relationships that the Quran introduces is the, uh, or actually it bases all of the relationships between man and God and other types of relationships is based on the notion of wilaya, whether it was mystical, uh, existential, even between families and inheritance. The notion of wilaya is introduced. A whole different social relationship system was introduced by Islam. And the Imams tried to develop that, and other groups benefited from it. And this is what our, our uh, lessons are going to be based upon. So, inshallah, next week we're going to go into the linguistic, etymological, uh, uh, understanding of the notion, and then we're going to move on to the Quranic one, see what the Quran presents wilaya as, the relationship between God and man, God and uh, man and Satan, man and man, and we'll see those different types of relationships in the Quran, and then we're going to uh, move on to the ahadith insha'Allah. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa ala alihi tayyibin al-tahirin.